guys welcome to gone in a flash a live streaming series from the mckenzie art gallery and neutral ground artist run center uh i'm kat blimke i'm jonathan carroll and we're digital programs coordinators at the mckenzie art gallery uh, so in this series we're looking at the upcoming dissolution of the adobe flash medium since 1996 adobe flash has introduced artists to creating interactive animated and web-based work but at the end of this year this powerful tool is being permanently removed from the internet uh, over the next uh, six weeks we're bringing artists digital archivists and game designers onto our live stream to talk about digital art technological obsolescence and archiving practices uh, today, as the live stream audience, you uh, play a key role. During today's live stream, uh, you'll be ask, able to ask questions in the chat by typing in the chat box. Uh, so these will be able to be directed to our guests, um, who will be able to respond them th uh, to them throughout the uh, live stream. Um, and so for those who are watching this live stream on a, com a desktop uh, so you're watching it on a web, a web browser. Uh, the chat is located on the right hand side. If you're watching on a mobile device, the chat is located below the video that you are watching. Uh, if you are having trouble locating the chat, make sure you are logged on uh, to an account on the platform that you are viewing the live stream. Uh, you're welcome to also, uh, while, while you are encouraged to ask questions, you're also welcome to talk to other audience members who are participating in the chat. But as always, please remember there is another person at the end of this username. So be nice. Um, as always, uh, our conversations about art and technology can only be occur, occur because of the land that facilitates every part of our lives. And we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land that we here are gathered on for this live stream is a Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, the Lakota, the Nakota, the Dakota, and the Métis people. And you are gathered wherever you might be, and we are uh, gathering with a wonderful group of panelists uh, uh, f from uh, nearby and, and far away, and I would just like to um, introduce everybody. Um, so we are joined by uh, Dragon Espensheed, and uh, Dragon is leading the preservation program at Rhizome, a new media art and net art organization founded in 1996 that holds the Art Base, a collection for more than 2,000 pieces of digital art. Starting with Dragon's tenure in 2014, Rhizome focused on research around structured emulation, web archiving, and linked data, which have been put into action for Net Art Anthology, a two-year online exhibition program, and the public web and the public web archiving service Conifer, uh, formerly known as WebRecorder.io. Uh, Dragon is known for his work as a net activist, net artist, and home computer musician. Thank you so much, Dragon, for joining us today. Um, uh, we also have Jonas Rickner, uh, and Jonas is a software analyst and game designer who is based in Switzerland. Uh, he is the creator of FlashGameHistory.com, a really awesome website, meticulously chronicling the rise and decline of the genre, as well as its long-lasting impact on the contemporary game development scene. And we uh, were found that website very useful in preparing this series. So thank you so much for that, Jonas. Um, or Jonas, sorry. Uh, uh, Clara, so uh, thirdly, we have our um, uh, our local participant in this uh, panel, uh, Clara Chen, who grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 territory, uh, with family from the Guangdong and Hong Kong regions of China. Clara's work stems from an interest in exploration of migration, separation, and the ways in which we are intertwined with cyberspace. Uh, Claire is a member of the CBC Creator Network and is a practicing expanded media artist and filmmaker. Over this year, Clara was an archive assistant at Neutral Ground Artist Run Center. Um, she worked with the rich body of media created ever since Neutral Ground's genesis in 1982 and archived the Neutral Ground Soil Flash website. Um, so what, uh, what we have in this panel is a really interesting sort of um, a Venn diagram of people specializing in uh, both digital art preservation, uh, uh, flash specifically, and then really interestingly, a specific instance of sort of using archiving practices uh, in in the wild, in the real world, as it were, um, by uh, in attempting to um, archive the uh, soil website, which is 
um, a, a project, a long running project by um, Neutral Ground, which is our partner in the Flash series. Um, so uh, we're really interested to uh, think through uh, some of the issues of um, digital art preservation uh, generally, as well as looking at Flash as a specific uh, case study in the um, the sort of effect of technological obsolescence on on art. Um, so uh, maybe we could uh, start today with, uh, should we start with the first question there, Kat? Sure. Um, there, as well as like focusing on this uh, particular case study of looking at Flash, we're also really interested in how um, just uh, galleries and institutions have confronted this challenge of digital art archiving uh, with uh, a, the broad array of mediums that the media that exist uh, as far as like what could be digital or online work. Um, Flash is not the, of course, is not the be all end all uh, of, of, of this type of work. Um, Dragon is, is at, with your work at Rhizome, uh, it's been very exciting to watch uh, what is being done there. I think like uh, Jonathan and I, we both work at a gallery that has a physical location and in at our gallery we have a vault and in the vault this in involves locking an object away for preservation, perhaps, you know, a special, someone might, special might be able to get access to it, if you, certainly if you're uh, someone working at the gallery, but uh, it's, you know, it's really locked away uh, from the public uh, and with uh, digital art and online work, you're often, that is not the context in which this art is created. Um, when you are trying to preserve uh, digital art, there's this context of access and, uh, and you know, being available uh, that it also can, is something that factors into many of these kinds of work. Uh, with, uh, when thinking about digital archi art archiving, how do you, uh, how have you approached, um, and the, and the Conifer project approached this, uh, maintaining this integrity of access with, uh, online or digital art archives? Yeah, this is, a this is indeed, a um, something that, that is at, at the core of Rhizome's preservation practices that we, um, that we try to understand digital art and especially online art and net art as something that's located in between a fine art thing, like something artifactual that you would traditionally lock away in a vault and um, shield from any physical interaction with anything else. But it's also, it has a, a huge performance aspect to it too, without actually being performance art. But it's, it's located in between these two um, practices and the performing part is usually done by a computer, not by a person. So kind of if you are, um, it's not only about the context of net art being created to be very accessible or like online games or something like that, but it's also that if you actually turn a computer off, the thing that you're looking at is gone, um, the object is not there anymore and you're left with, a, with an artifact that is maybe stored somewhere, but unless you can at any time and at will reproduce the performance, you don't have the thing, you don't, you cannot care for it, you cannot own it. So um, we have um, very much uh, focused on these performative aspects and also thought about how the, the act of preservation has something performative to it too. And um, it is also, it is also uh, important that you are kind of that's that's at least what I think. In the, in the original question that that you that you sent before the meeting, I was like, how can galleries and traditional institutions like um, think about this? And I guess what I see is that um, in the new media art or in the tradition of new media art preservation, um, there's like this idea: we will do whatever it takes to accommodate this um, art object. We will work with the artist. We will we will do whatever it takes, and that is something that is incredibly difficult to maintain. This, this works very well if the artist is still alive and if you can get them around to do tech support for you and so forth. But we are also now entering a time when the first digital artists are actually passing away or have 
choose another career um, before that. So I think it is important that you, as an institution, develop a kind of preservation ideology, or how do you say, or like something that you want to do, like how do you want to preserve, um, and offer that as something that also, as a, as, a, as a system that you can kind of use to communicate with artists, for example. Um, because the, if you're saying this, is, this always has to be new or this always has to be the latest thing and you each time, for example, re-implement um, re an artwork once it doesn't play anymore in your browser or on your mobile phone, that's just, that doesn't work. That's too expensive and too, um, like, too laborious. You will only be able to collect like five items. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, and I think what is yeah, and digital digital practice and especially online practice is so broad and also, you know, people they they flip in and out of the role as an artist. Uh, so there's like m a much broader field of practice and and materials used. And if you are, as an arts institution, cannot, I don't know, like represent that in a way, and your collection is like ten pieces, then it's like you know, it's not. I think you have to. You have to think about scaling the collection um, and what abstractions are important or like will, will enable you to do that. Um, and that seems, yeah, th uh, that seems noteworthy in the, uh, in the conversation about Flash specifically where there is part of the, the thing that we talk about uh, when we're talking about Flash is that it provided for this um, breadth of different works to be made and like that is sort of a difficult thing to capture is just the true um uh Jonas I think the your your the website that you made does some especially the the infographics that are on it displaying the popularity of different flash games at different times uh does something to uh suggest um that uh, breadth of content being produced and the fact that um, uh, Flash, the accessibility of the tools provided for so many people to make stuff with Flash. Um, I guess that makes a good segue uh, to sort of think more, ask you, uh, Jonas, although I, there is, <laughs> I'm wondering, Dragon, I have some things I'm thinking of based on what you said, but maybe we'll go back to that. Uh, Jonas, uh, when we're thinking of uh, Flash creating these accessible tools tools for, for many people to create content in upload to the internet, how is that uh, prefiguring uh, contemporary methods of content creation and as well as distribution? And then sort of, can you see a relationship between or maybe an evolution between uh, Flash content creation and contemporary content creation or maybe differences? Yeah, so in the Flash world, it was a very, um, Flash was special because it was a very different sort of tool than we have nowadays. Nowadays, you see a lot of uh, kind of programmer focused tools, whereas Flash was really started out as only an animation tool for drawing and making animations. And then that's how a lot of artists actually started in Flash. You start with drawing animations, and then you just uh, you add some code to it, and then it can move. And uh, and nowadays the tools like Unity or other tools, they're more focused on. It's harder to get into for non-programmers, let's say. So I think that's also what opened up the doors to so much diverse content, is anybody could just pick it up. Um, then, uh, sort of going off of that, um, Clara, uh, you have had as in your work for, um, neutral ground recently, uh, archiving the soil website, uh, you've had some sort of firsthand experiences of, uh, an artist run center using flash as well as potentially artists using flash. I wonder if, um, I wonder if you could give some examples of how artists might have used uh, Flash that you found in the Soil website, or in addition to that, um, how the Flash-based structure of the site itself might have influenced the work that's on it? Yes, definitely. I can uh, share my screen and show the website itself as nice. I talk about this. Um, share screen. Oops, let me, yes, sorry, I made you disappear. Let me just... Oh. 
There we go. Awesome. Nice. There we go. Yeah. So Soil Digital Media. Yeah. It was like an expansive and collaborative project facilitated by Neutral Ground Artist Run Center uh, in Regina, SK, uh, Saskatchewan. It lasted from 1997 to roughly 2015. And we've had artists across North America and some internationally who have participated in creating and exhibiting performative digital net art workshops and ex exhibitions, panels, and flash art. So um, a large chunk of the project was this flash website, which they call a digital gallery and archive, which I found that funny in itself because I think they had no expectation that Flash would be um, gone by this year when making this archive. But thankfully it's still up here um, and I've been archiving it uh, throughout the summer uh, using Conifer. So it's safe there and it's backed up, but I can like show some examples of like stuff that was made. So. We have um, Speaking the Language of Spiders by a Métis artist in Alberta. Um, and it, like, I feel like these kinds of websites were like, I personally describe them as like tunnels. Um, so you just enter them, you have no idea what's happening. And there's like an image and you click on it and then you go on to another image. And there's like, just like images that the artists have made and prose. And it's just like very fun and interactive in, in this way. And it's also like quite low fidelity. Like you get a lot of content without it like taking up too much storage. And that's like another great aspect of Flash that I find like is missing nowadays. Like having, being able to share like a large array of content um, without overloading. Um, your storages like this when when I archived this entirely it was only 1.67 gigabytes so that's one like example of like a project that I found was pretty cool um there's also positive by Sheila Aronofsky and Ian Stevens um it was about Ian's experience with uh HIV during the AIDS crisis um in the 90s and he has since passed, but Sheila is uh, still alive. Um, and I find this is also like another kind of tunnel kind of project. And we also see like Next Terminator 2 by Guimo Gomez Pena and Roberto Cifuentes. And this was fun. Like it was like kind of like a cyber debate forum um, it had a few uh, gifts here and there, but um, yeah, here's a cool gift here. And also sound. Um, where they kind of just talked about like, kind of like a cyber, like uh, not so much censored debate about um, national identity and First Nations identity where they had questions and all of such here. It was pretty fun. And um, artists also implemented a lot of animation with their works. So we have Sketchbook, SAS Sketchbook by Jennifer Hamilton, where we see this a landing page and we open images to animations. And I don't think that's being screen shared right now, but it oh, opens yeah. a window. It might have opened a oh, a window, separate yeah. window. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's I... loading now, but I don't think that we're getting the content. No. That's a limitation of Skype, unfortunately. That's not, uh, that is not on your end. <laughs> that is unfortunate. But, but uh, um, these the website are all... is still here. Yeah, the website is still yeah. here. 
uh, there will also be, Clara, you'll also be uh, conducting uh, a real dig through this, uh, the soil archives, as we're calling it, um, on uh, December 19th. Um, so people should be marking their calendars where we're going to go in depth into each work before uh, it, all that exists is uh, the archive. Uh, not not this archive that's <laughs> as, as as it's listed here, um, but yeah. it is it is interesting. Uh, uh, the Adobe Flash it's going to be the software. Uh, it is going to be continuing in in much limited fu functionality as Adobe, Adobe Animate. Um, like it's not the the. There of course exists different uh, different ways that people engaged with uh, Flash as creators. They were using the Adobe Flash software, but then every a lot of people were are more familiar with it as the plugin that allows these things to run on the browser. Um, however, this new version, Adobe Animate, is stripping many of the interactive functions um, and that made it uh, really uh, powerful for creating like online interactive work, uh, and is just focusing back on those or original kind of intentions of it being. A, a tool for animation. Um, uh, I was wondering, Jonas, uh, you were mentioning like projects uh, or um, uh, platforms such as Unity, which artists were using uh, for uh, that are again more kind of developer heavy on that side. Um, but as we are seeing like this kind of stripping down or paring down of the actual like flash tools, are there other things that are uh, tools that are appealing to artists or that are kind of coming in to fill, fill this gap between uh, facilitating uh, a more uh, maybe a shorter learning curve for artists to, uh, to be creating uh, interactive, engaging work online? Yeah, so you see kind of around the since 2013 or 2014, when Flash was really starting to fall off a cliff, and all of the developers were looking for new tools and jumping ship. A lot of them went into mobile or some of them console. And uh, yeah, so many jumped to, uh, to Unity, actually. It had an exporter at the time for HTML5 too. But uh, just as Flash was dying, kind of the new technology, HTML5, was not really there yet. It didn't quite work. The Unity exporter didn't quite work. So there was kind of a, a void in the sense which allowed the, the app stores that we have nowadays to take over. So all the audiences, actually, they shifted kind of the, um, to the app stores. There's not really a big online game audience looking for games anymore. So it's really hard now that HTML5 uh, works pretty well for making games. It's uh, it's quite hard to get that audience off the ground yet and start it again, because the companies built their huge like walled garden and you have to go through them and take a 30% cut and things like that. But yeah. also, the, yeah, the animators, they started, I think, they went where the audiences went. They started YouTube channels, a lot of them new grounds yes uh, uh for folks who are tuning into our uh our last uh, uh last program in this series, uh, we really were, f were talking about, um, or Paolo Petercini, who was a presenter for that uh, program, was talking about how there was this, the, the idea that uh, Apple uh, releases this uh, notice saying, oh, we're not going to be supporting Flash anymore, really goes hand in hand with uh, the rise of their own app store and their own way of, you know, really gatekeeping um, the access to uh, games and kind of more uh, popular entertainment um, through their own channels that they could then take a cut of. Um, the uh, the uh, I was thinking um, this this kind of you're struggling with corporate monopolies when you're working with uh, tech as a digital artist, but as a digital archivist, um, you're how do you uh, how would one kind of negotiate this as well if you're always kind of forced uh, to play with the largest uh, or forced to the play the rules of the largest player in, in the game. Um, I'm thinking, uh, Dragon, this might be something that you um, have uh, some fair experience in uh, with your own, uh, even with your own uh, personal work, which maybe we'll have a chance to uh, talk about your uh, research projects. Um, but with the, uh, like with the Rhizome, 
uh, Rhizome's projects, how can you kind of negotiate these corporate monopolies when uh, you're, you're, just, you're just trying to keep things working together and everybody's fighting over who gets the biggest mm. piece of the pie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, um, that is indeed uh, that is indeed a big challenge, and it's it's also funny how um, we think about products and uh, like like something like a product like Flash, but that is sometimes called uh, I don't know a technology or so. But it's not it's it's a product, and um, so as if you're interested in preserving um, software, which is on like the abstract level what we are trying to do here. Um, you need to put all of your efforts into into open source and free software, um, and you need to get involved with the maintenance and support of open source and free software, because also that's it's not a free ride um, to to use op uh, to use open source software, but you have to like make sure that the communities that maintain these pieces are actually thriving. Um, for instance. Um, yeah, another thing that, 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 is, that is important is that the, you, you kind of need to um, think about the, the practice, like the, the creation of the art and the, like the, the distribution of the art and access to the art, probably a bit um, more than about its manifestation. So sometimes we are saying, oh yeah, this is, this is like flash or so, this, which, which might qualify as its own genre of production, as, as Jonas and, and Clara also have like, like shown. <laughs> Um, but you also have to think um, what is the uh, how are you going to build a bridge to the audience that is not able to run this thing on their own anymore and so um, our our approach has been like to full on um, bet on emulation so to say it, it's not a bad that's it's more a, a core principle of computer science that you know any computer can do what any other computer can do maybe slower or faster or i mean given enough time and resources that's the saying and um so for example we have been able to to use emulation for uh, all of these things and you probably have noticed that the, the ruffle uh, specific flash emulator has been like gaining a lot of attention now but since the internet archive says we are committed to ruffle and congregate has um, committed to Ruffle, and th the good thing about emulation is, even if the, when we are talking about a Ruffle emulator right now, which is like specialized for Flash, and is also I think very much made with the perspective of preserving Flash games, which is maybe something that we need to talk about in re with regard to nostalgia later. Um, but the, um, um, it is now able to play like quite a bit of flash, not later ones and not ones that do like fancy scripting things, but it will only get better. Um, it's, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a great thing about it. Maybe I, I can quickly show how we are using this um, when I share my screen, one second. Um, here, you should see the, the amazing logo of my organization. Yeah, okay, there it is. great. Yeah, so I want to show how we do this, for example, with this work, World of Awe by Jarl Kanarek, um, who is all, which is also a piece that mixes Flash and Shockwave and, you know, whatever. Uh, artists usually also don't read the instructions or work like classic software development firms and say, okay, I'm making a Flash project because then I can export it to whatever Android phones in 2005 or something. But it's more like... Um, especially on the web, things are always mixed. And that's one of the things why we are not using the Ruffle um, emulator, but we are more going for, for full-on emulators and, and streaming them. Um, so these are emulators that are running on cloud computers and they, um, they make the whole operating system appear again, so to say, and that includes any software that the artist might have used. Uh, so it's not only limited to Flash, but Shockwave and so forth. I'm not sure if you can hear the sound actually, but this work mainly uses Flash for sound. Sound, um, um, And and you see it uses all these pop-up windows and so forth, but it's all contained inside that thing. Because um, as we have seen before with Clara's presentation, um, Browsers today, they not only support, don't support Flash anymore, they don't support pop-up windows anymore, they don't support auto-playing sound, they don't support 
Um, I don't know, you can't make QuickTime movies work on Windows now without being like a qualified Microsoft engineer or something. Um, and so um, all of these things usually work together and that's how we are trying to, to, approach, to approach the preservation of these. Um, but I, would, I also want to say that projects like Ruffle, I, I'll turn this off, I, I have a, there's a big wind sound here. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear it. It's not um, coming through. Also this wanna but yeah. Oh yeah, it's very loud here. <laughs> so, um, and I think the um, uh, what what Ruffle is really targeted towards is like the self-contained flash game. That was also, for example, um, the the game producers would distribute this um, would distribute their games across several different like hosting sites where you might need to pay to access them or not, or they would. Uh, compile them into an exe file that you could run on your Windows machine or something. But, um, and that's what, what Ruffle really shines at, is like take that single, um, that single flash file and enact that again in, in a browser or not. Um, yeah, so um, this is another um, great work that uh, by Entropy 8 Super, Skin on Skin on Skin, which uses Flash and dynamic HTML and all these types of things together. Um, it has a lot of sound too, and yeah, Flash was, especially in the early web, very much used for for sound and video because it was basically the only way you could make video play on anyone's computer. Um, yeah. So okay, that's just how I and and you also see, for example, how the rendering and everything, like the the crisp pixels and so forth, that you don't get today anymore because the the browsers today assume that everything's a photo and blur uh, small graphics when they're enlarged. So these are these are all aspects that, um, yeah, Flash is, is one of the aspects that has been like deprecated. Okay, close this. Yeah, these are great works. You should all look at them and the NetArt, Rhizome's NetArt anthology. Oh yes, we'll link um, them to uh, we'll link them in the chat. And and many of our uh, much of our audience is is. Uh, familiar yeah. with this series uh, through uh, the uh, the local gallery, uh, Dunlop Art Gallery, hosting the Art Happens Here uh, uh, yes, in yeah. the spring. Um, so hopefully some yeah. of these works will be familiar to our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we have, so, and so regarding the open source um, aspect of it, um, the emulation framework that we're using, EAAS, is an open source um, project that we are actively involved in, like with running res research projects around it and working with the developers directly. I'm also super delighted to hear that Clara has been using Conifer, which provides for yeah, um, legacy browsers to replay Flash 2 and to, to like, yeah, keep, that, keep these files uh, performative. Um, and yeah, so that's basically we don't we don't try to componentize the things too much because that's not manageable also on an institutional knowledge basis. So for example, I have no idea about all the details that Windows 98 requires to run. That would be crazy. Um, and I mean, even Microsoft doesn't know how Windows 10 works apparently. <laughs> so the so how can a, a small arts institution like do that? So what we are trying to um, the level that we are trying to approach this is the highest abstraction possible. So for example, in Conifer, the decision was we will provide a browser that can replay Flash and Java applets, for example, um, for really complex uh, systems where we require the whole operating system, like these artworks that I've shown, where they also interact maybe with certain design elements in the user interface. We are trying to like, yeah, just use the whole the whole digital environment from like as, as a, that was targeted at the creation of the artwork. So what are the main uh, challenges or troubles you ran into with uh, preserving digital art so far? Is it like that, for example, people don't have a mouse anymore today or uh, that the interface is changing or it's trying to access a Twitter API or what are the most challenging works to preserve actually? Oh yeah, the, the most challenging ones are indeed the ones that um, we call blurry. Um, so, um, for example, Jan and Kanoeksberg or the the soil website, which is kind of self-contained, is is nice because you can draw a clear boundary around the work and say like, so 
I need these files and I, if a file is missing, I know who to talk to and they can look on their attic if there's an old diskette or something that contains this file. Um, but just as you said, if an um, if, um, artwork makes real use of the networked environment, that becomes much more challenging. Um, and it, it, uh, many artworks, like you said, use the Twitter API, I don't know, to show whatever President Trump has been saying recently or whatever, uh, that, that has been very popular, or the Flickr API or Google image search has been super popular among artists. Um, and of course, uh, it's impossible to draw a boundary around these systems. You cannot like get them into your organization. Um, and But web archiving is a very good way to um, preserve some of the, uh, like the affordances and, and performance uh, possibilities of these uh, services. So for instance, you can use a web archiving tool like Conifer to preserve a bunch of, um, like capture a bunch of Twitter posts and then, or you could also preserve the interaction, like the network traffic in between uh, some kind of artwork and the remote API. And then in the future, you could at least not all, you couldn't get all the possibilities uh, while this API, for example, was still active when it, once it's discontinued. But you can at least say, okay, I've captured like um, 5,000 typical image searches from that time to the Google image search service and then you will be able to at least serve like if if an artwork works with I don't know users typing in words you could then say okay if you use one of these five thousand words the artwork yeah. still, still performs as it did. But it um, requires a specific infrastructure, right, for each artwork. So you have to kind of decide which ones to preserve and which ones not. Um, you mean on the artwork level? Yeah, uh, yeah, because you have to. Uh kind of set this up, as we said, for each artwork, because every is a bit different? Or? That is, um, it is, it is uh, the, the biggest challenge in this field when you set up your infrastructure is at what abstraction level you want to go in so that the most works can benefit. So for example, with the Haus der Elektronische Künste in Basel, which has collected a work that uses the, the Google Image Search API. So we started to design a database that does dictionary attacks basically against the Google image search service. It just goes through a dictionary and saves the results at different times. And so once this goes off or is, um, or uh, we will have a huge database of words that match to images and at what time that was the case. And that can be used for different artworks. Um, and that's the, uh, uh, at, at the moment, for example, a, a huge problem is the, the Apple platform, which is, um, there's a lot of audience and artists uh, also know that this is an audience they can sell art to and this gave birth to a lot of like indie game development and all these kind of things. However, it's super hard to get like a functioning emulator of, uh, let's say the, the iOS platform because it's so locked, it's it's incredibly locked down. Um, but once this works, once there is like a reliable way to replay iOS, just like we did uh, with macOS 9 or with Windows 98 or Windows 2000 and XP and 7 and I don't know, macOS 10.7 Lion or so, these work fine in emulation already. And once you are over that hump, um, suddenly like hundreds of games or I don't know, artistic apps might be working again, depending how good that emulator is. So that's, um, that is, I think, um, a tactic that will work and that will give curators also the biggest freedom uh, in the long run, instead of like concentrating on a single work and say, okay, we will re-implement this in HTML5. This is incredibly, it, it requires so much expertise, like you need people that actually understand, for example, Flash totally, like very deeply and understand HTML5 very deeply 
Um, and those people, they have very well-paying jobs at large corporations. They are usually hard to how to get to work for like a museum or a gallery or so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much brain power devoted to uh, getting clicks, increasing the amount of clicks. Eyeballs, always, eyeballs. Yeah. Eyeballs. <laughs> uh, but it's just really interesting, uh, Jonas, you were kind of mentioning like uh, this, uh, you know, you having to really decide on what, uh, what gets preserved. Um, oh, actually we have, uh, we have a we have a uh, guest question, so uh, I'll save mine. Um, but yeah, if you want to, for anyone listening, if you want to drop any questions in the chat, uh, yeah, we can start answering them now. I think this is this is open for anyone to answer. Uh, Luke asks, have you noticed a large increase in the desire slash the need to web archive uh, with the end of Flash? Yeah, is it, I guess is Flash driving home the sort of like obsolescence or potential for obsolescence? Yeah, yeah I can answer that question. Oh, sorry. I, I'll, I'll no, take a stab at it for a few seconds and then take it over to Jonas. <laughs> yeah, there was um, a large like interest in archiving um, this Flash website with once when we figured out that um, the Flash plugin was ending. Um, I think um, Kat and John are actually also board members for Neutral Ground and pointing pointed out the fact that Flash was ending. So that's how we, um, our programming director, Amber, knew about it. And um, they implemented this role for me um, to archive this Flash website particularly. Um, yeah, there's definitely like, we feel like the loss that Flash, uh, the end of Flash is giving us. Like, um, it's definitely like a lot of nostalgia that's coming around. Um, this month and at the end of this year. And like, I looked at your website, Jonas, um, and just revisited all these uh, Flash games that I used to play as a kid um, who, who like grew up on Flash games, like New Newgrounds and DeviantArt, like um, it was like very nostalgic. So yeah, there, like definitely like, there was no, not like, at least for our organization, um, there wasn't that much interest in archiving our website until we knew that Flash was ending. <laughs> so we're just buckling up gears uh, this this last month to make sure that um, all the links are patched up on Conifer for soil. Uh, Jonas, I wonder if yeah. have you noticed any like increased uh, push or awareness of the need to archive or? Yeah, same as Clara. Like, yeah, definitely more. Um, yeah, developers too thinking about how to how to preserve their games, how to help to preserve their whole catalog. But I mean, many of them also not because many of them were just teenagers when they did it, and now they they're doing something else. <laughs> so. Um, even yeah. Yeah, even creator of Flash, I sent, was emailing with him. He, uh, he said, too, he thought about like how could we make something that preserves like all the content as something like a book, so it could be treated as valuable information. But uh, he said like the need to drive business growth and adding features and capabilities to Flash kind of trumped the need for permanence because that. Uh, it's usually expensive, so they didn't really do it. Um, have you, uh, Durgan, have you seen uh, sort of, has there been a, uh, any sort of an uptick in people's interest in Conifer specifically as a way to um, archive Flash? Um, yes, and yeah, basically the Rhizome inboxes have been flooded with <laughs> questions about like what do we do now and it, it's not only from from <laughs> artists but also um you know journalists or like nice art organizations like yours um where uh, I, th I think what is what is uh, what is kind of a, um, a bit of a 
issue with the preservation field is that preservation is something that you basically need to do all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, either you need to drive, you put in, you need to put more features into your software as it was the case with Flash, or you need to present new art, or you need to, I don't know, work on your next exhibition and so forth. And so the, um, these uh, like dramatic storytelling points in the, in the history of a medium, if you want to call Flash like a medium, so like this has been scrapped and it was Steve Jobs' fault and all these things help a lot. Um, uh, so, some people are really good at making these stories and if, if especially if a lot of people have a, a history of, of playing Flash or grew up on, on Flash games, as you said, Clara, which I think is something that is shared among many um, net users, you can get like the, the critical momentum going and then um, for example, the Internet Archive also timed the release of the Ruffle integration into Internet Archive to like like the end date of Flash. And you you need to take these things into account basically when you are planning your preservation. Like if there's a good story around it, that's always better. But actually, you have to do it all the time. <laughs> you you can you can just get more support for it if there's a cool like if there's a villain in it. Like <laughs> ev everyone hates Adobe already, so. That's just one, one like drop in the bucket. I like it. Yeah, it's like how do you brand your preservation efforts? Yeah. <laughs> uh, with like the marketing store. Or like make maintenance <laughs> more sexy. Give give <laughs> give maintenance a villain. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we uh, Clara, you mentioned uh, the idea of nostalgia, and that was something that we had been talking about in our. Uh, emails with you folks um yeah we'd we'd come across that term uh uh dragon in a blog by uh your collaborator olia lialina and your collaborative project one terabyte of the kilobyte age um really yeah it's sort of in the uh, if for for the we'll I will link it in the chat um but those who aren't familiar uh who don't listen to 99% invisible where uh it was recently featured um it, uh, this is a uh, project going through the archive of the geocities um uh uh websites um after those were since those have been uh taken offline um but this uh so we'll, we'll we're linking that in the chat for those who want to uh uh, browse and, and look at, the, at this project, um, but this this concept of net nostalgia uh, that we came across through there, I think, was really helpful when we were uh, looking at like this history of Flash, because um, of course, like when again, I, I was somebody who uh, who grew up, yeah, watching Flash animations uh, on DeviantArt, playing them on Newgrounds, like they were. Uh, kind of like slash content of different like fantasy and anime characters. Um, so it wasn't really the kind of stuff that gets preserved on a, on a net art archive or anything. <laughs> um, I might be preserving them for myself, but uh, <laughs> um, I, it, it just sort of, when considering the history of Flash, sort of thinking about the real variety of artists who are able to access it and the variety of content that was produced um, and like from, yeah, fantasy anime slash uh, fic uh, fan fan videos to um, some really incredible artwork. Um, what we're mourning the death of Flash and kind of looking back at it with this like really uh, rose tinted, these really rose tinted glasses. Um, how can we like see past this nostalgia to really like consider this medium in a, in a historical context? Um, I mean, this is a big question. <laughs> Especially considering what we've also mentioned a couple of times in this conversation of like, the uh, the accounting for the breadth of, of content when you're trying to go about archiving digital work. Yeah, I feel like with like having plugins such as Flash and also having like other softwares like OpenGL being terminated within this decade, like I personally have questions about where humanity as a whole is headed <laughs> in terms of like technology. Like, it feels like, is this, like, are we, like, is this weird, like, evolution in, in quotes where, like, there's so many tools that are being constantly, like, rebranded or developed and then, but also erased. Like, there's this, like, ephemerality that goes 
with digital media sometimes and it's like there's certain like more levels of discretion and like being able to sort through like all of this data that's being uploaded by the second as like a digital artist in that context it's really weird it's like somehow like if you had a music library and you could only listen to the songs that are three years old if they're older <laughs> they're gone they have to be maintained that's kind of how i feel about the games <laughs> which is really weird but yeah i don't i don't know either yeah it, it, i th i think this is a there is this anxiety that a lot of um um artists or even just just fans of of, of things or like art lovers or general audience have been feeling because yeah again flash is such a point where you would say okay there this is like a, a turning point like my youth is now over or i cannot i will not be able i will not be able to show this to my kids for, for example like 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 this um this feeling um and so what uh, we at rhizome have been have been trying to do is to establish tools like with conifer being the most successful one um and and support the development of these tools so that um, yeah, not only the the artful flash will be preserved, but also maybe something that is valuable to someone, but that would not go into a museum. Um, and that that communities who are interested in preserving something that they grouped around, make be slash fan fiction, flash animations or something, that they can create their own libraries of of what's important to them. Um, and that's also that's I think going back to the first question a little bit how should how should archives and, and galleries and museums maybe see their role? It's it's not only about presenting themselves and what great taste they might have or not have and um, say this is this is the view into the history, but think about how can they enable communities to um, like to preserve their own things and to preserve what's important to them. So for example, this, um, this spider language website, I know this is an incredibly important website for a certain community, but in like the wider field of art, no one even knows it. And I'm like super happy that you managed to, to grab a copy of it. Um, and that is, uh, that is like very important because otherwise the, um, even the evaluation of culture is almost becoming impossible. Because if you can, in digital art especially, if you can only look back like three years, um, that's incredibly bad. It will produce a lot of like, uh, like really boring, artistically boring stuff. And you can see that, for example, in VR, where now the, um, like the turnaround for new glasses and the, the cutting off of compatibility is, um, it's really an artistic level. Um, because, yeah, I mean, these, for example, the companies that produce the headsets and they, they commission artists to do things they don't even know that, I don't know, in the 90s, artists were working with um, VR already. So, <laughs> and they would then talk to a painter instead of, a, of someone who has like experience in making um, digital art or 3D art or even VR art. So, um, but it's possible. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that, yeah, memory institutions have to have to take on as a kind of a, a new role as as enablers. Uh, I I love that uh, yeah. as yeah institutions as enablers of communities is a really strong yeah. Also, like the idea of everyone having to become their own digital archivists in a way if they care about something and um thanks it's nice that it's it's nice that conifer is providing uh, a tool that we can start to explore doing that um we can uh promo that we will be talking uh more with clara about that uh in the future we're doing going to be doing a, a workshop about how to use uh conifer to art so you can become your own digital archivist um and archive all the deviant art uh flash fanfic uh, <laughs> you you want to preserve for your grandchildren um when they when they reach a suitable age they can see it too <laughs> and they, uh that will be the, that date is uh december 10th for the workshop 
Yeah. Um, and we also have a uh, fantastic, I'm coming up next week, uh, 6.30 CST on Thursday, December 3rd, uh, with longtime net artist and um, uh, flash uh, art, artwork creator, uh, Natalie Lawhead. Um, and yeah, and just check the mckenzie.art website for a total list of all the re remaining programs in the series. Um, thank, thank you so much, Dragon, Jonas, and Clara, for talking with us today. It was a fantastic conversation. <laughs> uh, is there anything that any I've linked uh, some of the webs I've linked the websites we've been talking about in the chat for folks, but. Uh, is there anything else um, that we can point uh, people towards if they want to follow you or uh, are interested to hear more? Yeah, you can find me on social media as Cyberspace Void. Great. That's my handle. <laughs> Yeah, we've got uh, we've got folks saying thanks to all the panelists for a really excellent discussion. I'm super happy to be here um, in this panel. It's, it's like a lovely discussion with all you guys. Yeah, yeah thanks. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like the web art community, and like just like I think overall we're so fortunate that. A program like Conifer exists because I don't think Neutral Ground would have been able to archive this Flash website without Conifer's help. So, yeah, thank you, Dragon, for that. Wow, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> me me melting my heart. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I will drop everyone's, I'll drop links to folks. Uh... Um, socials socials in, the in the chat but uh thank you so much everyone for uh watching um we'll s see you again on thursday uh we'll see the audience on thursday yes. um see everyone and into the uh and now we'll play our outro uh animation bye, -bye. <laughs> uh just a second so we're still all on the call